you have your Bible, we're going to open it to Psalm 147. Psalm 147. And I have other scriptures to read, but that one we're going to stand up for, and then we'll sit down and we will read the others. If you would, stand with me. Verse 3. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Let's pray. Father God, we come to your word and we bow before it. It is true. And this verse is as true as in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It is as true as you so loved the world that you gave your only begotten son. It is a truth that we need in this day because many by self-infliction and many by the infliction of others have been wounded in our hearts, and we need healing. So now, God, we call upon you, Jehovah Rapha, the God of all healing, come and heal the brokenhearted. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. You may be seated. We're going to go ahead. Uh, I'm going to get to the other verses in a minute, Um, Shannon. But as I mentioned to you, the, the, the title of this message, this sermon, is The Sound of Freedom, and I'm, I'm naming it that after the movie. I did see the movie. It is a powerful, it is a profound uh, movie filled with a present-day reality that is painful to think about. And I promise you that when you go to see it, your emotions will go from absolute vengeance and hatred and thinking about ways to... Inv- invoke uh, brutal vengeance on someone uh, to fear, uh, to worry, uh, and then to uh, hope and rescue. And um, we did a morning word on this this past week, and uh, it it immediately went to like 1.2 thousand views, and most of our morning words hover around 500-600. So it was basically double, and I had some people that sent me some messages a private message that identified intimately uh, with the message. And um, a lot of people, ministered to a lot of people, so I decided that I wanted to kind of bring it into the the main sanctuary and talk about it. Uh, And basically what we're going to talk about, not so much of certain, certainly it does uh, entail that we have all been wounded by sin. Sin is the root cause of everything, uh, evil and wicked in the world. Uh, and that was by Adam's sin. So Adam uh, brought all of this heartache and pain, but you and I have perpetuated it. And in this world of evil and wickedness, it's growing more evil and wicked. And not necessarily so much so that people are growing more wicked and evil, although they are, but it's, being ex- it, it's, it's showing itself in exponential um, manifestations because we have social media, and we have the means by which to see uh, now and hear about and find out about things that have always been going on, but have just escaped our knowledge. I want to begin by saying that uh, uh, I want to talk about all who have been uh, hurt or wounded in their lives, and again, whether it be self-inflicted, like alcoholism or addiction, or divorce, or whatever, uh, but also that which has been inflicted upon us by other people. Mental abuse, emotional abuse, which were hand in hand, sexual abuse, molestation, uh, and in the extreme in- uh, uh, extreme incidences of sexual exploitation, prostitution, human trafficking, and um, child slavery. That's going on in this world. But again, we've been killing kids on the altar of sacrifice since the days of the Bible. 
Jesus has a very solemn warning. I want to begin with that. I want to begin with this by just telling you that Jesus pointed a, a very pointed finger in his word about this. I want to go to Matthew chapter 18, verses 3 through 7. Uh, you don't have to go there. We'll just look at it on the screen. And Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, the topic here is conversion, but the example he's using is children. So there's children physically and humans, but there's also spiritual children, young ones who, who are um, just being justified but, and are just now starting their sanctification. So we're talking about the vulnerable, the vulnerable spiritually and the vulnerable physically and mentally. So it says, <clears throat> Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of offenses. For offenses must come. But woe to that man by whom the offense comes. I believe that every sin can be forgiven by God except that which rejects God, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit according to the Scriptures. But I must tell you that according to the parable of the soils, there is a condition of the heart known as the, stone, I mean the uh, hardened soil in which the Word of God does not penetrate. We get there through a process of hardening our hearts. We talked about that in our Sunday school lesson today. But I will say this, in all of my years, and not to say that I've been doing it all that long, but I have been doing this about 25, 26, 27 years. I've never seen a pedophile repent. I've seen alcoholics. I've seen crystal meth addicts. I've seen wife beaters. I've seen gang bangers and murderers and rapists. I've never seen, maybe you have, a pedophile repent. I've never seen it or read about it. I googled it, as a matter of fact. Repentant pedophiles and got nothing. The reason I say that is because I believe there's a place that a man or a woman can go in their heart that isn't beyond the reach of God. It's because God won't reach there. It's not because he can, it's because he won't. Because to get to that place, you have to bypass all of God's grace and all of God's mercy and all of God's truth and all that you intuitively know to be right, even if you are a lost person. And so what I say today, I say with fear and trembling. Because God is serious when it comes to these types of sins and particularly those that affect children. Solemn warning. Now, let's move to Luke chapter 4, <clears throat> verse 16 through 21. Jesus has just stepped into the public scene. The king has come and has brought his kingdom. And this is the kingdom of the Lord. We just described to you a part of the kingdom of darkness. This is the kingdom of the Lord. So he came to Nazareth. That's his hometown where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Now we have a New Testament application of the Old Testament verse we just read in Psalm. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Meaning that, well, first of all, let me just kind of throw this out for FYI. 
It says to, uh, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, at that point right there, he stops quoting. He stops quoting Isaiah chapter 61. The next verse says, and to declare the vengeance of the Lord. So Christ came in his first advent to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. He came to bring life, hope, redemption, peace, joy, faith. He's going to come again. His second advent will be to usher in, or he, it will be ushered in, by the day of wrath, the day of judgment. But he cuts it off because today we are in the acceptable year of the Lord. What does it mean, the acceptable year of the Lord? Well, those that were reading it would know from the Old Testament ver uh, verses of Isaiah 61 that he was talking about the year of Jubilee. And that is, on the year of Jubilee, every seventh year, all debts were paid and all slaves went free. All the debts were erased so that no one was a servant all of his life. He had a chance to go free. His debts were paid. And so Jesus became the forever year of Jubilee. He became the eternal year of Jubilee. That when he forgave our debts, they were eternally forgiven. That when he set us free, we were eternally set free. That when he brought us peace, we have an eternal peace. Not every seven years, not something that has to be renewed, but something that was a one and done. And he came to declare the acceptable year of the Lord. Now this is something that we forget because we don't have a problem understanding that at the cross, redemption, the redemption price was paid to buy us back from the, the, the clutches of sin and its penalty, but also to, re, to uh, free us from the clutches of sin and its power. That we're not only forgiven of our sin, that we may have, have eternal life, but these have both spiritual and physical, i.e., by that I mean earthly connotations. That he didn't just come to heal the brokenhearted because we were broken by sin, but he came to bro heal the brokenhearted because of the sin that broke us and the consequences of that sin. He came because the, the healing here and the liberty here and the sight here and the, and the freedom from oppression is a complete and total restoration of the Imago Dei, the image of God. In other words, God didn't come to make us better us. He came to make us a new us. And He came to make us to restore in its fullness the Imago Dei of God. That's why when we get to heaven, there will be no more sadness, no more sorrow, no more pain, for the former things have passed away Behold, all things have become new. God's not here to just make you better. God's here to make you new. Amen. And he, you and I can experience that to its fullness in the sense of, of uh, the, the fullness of what we can have on the earth. But we are, we're, we're leaving a lot on the table here. We're, we're, we're kind of getting uh, completely satisfied with forgiveness of sins, and rightfully so, that means that we're not going to hell but the, the enemy doesn't give up there. The enemy, if he can't keep us from hell in eternity, wants us to live in hell on the earth. And Jesus didn't come to set us free from our sin so that we can live in hell the rest of our lives. He came that we could be saved from hell eternity, uh, in eternity, but also that we might live in the freedom of Christ while we walk on this earth, Amen. while we live on this earth. Jesus begins his ministry, and then he closes, he, he makes this quote, and then he closes the book, and he says, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And here's what he means. The one who heals is here. The one who delivers is here. The one who consoles, and the one who comforts, and the one who restores is here. And in my kingdom, in my kingdom, your heart doesn't have to be broken anymore. In my kingdom, your mind doesn't have to be scattered anymore. In my kingdom, you can have the mind of Christ. In my kingdom, you can have joy. Even if you've never had it, you can have it for the first time. He said, I leave you my peace. My peace I give to you. Not as the world giveth do I give to you. I give you an everlasting peace. A peace that passes all understanding. You may never have had it. And you've never had it if you're not in the kingdom. But once you get in the kingdom, you can have it and you can keep it. Amen. It'll keep you if you'll keep it. It'll set you free if you'll let it. His atoning death would not only pay for the penalty of our sin, but it would break the power of sin. 
And it would work from the inside out, beginning with our spirit in justification and progressing to our soul through sanctification and ending with our body in glorification. God is going to take back what sin claimed. God is going to take back through the last Adam what the first Adam gave away. And don't blame it all on Adam because we've all done our fair share. He came, and in one word, if we had one word that we could describe what Christ did for us at the cross, it would be this, freedom. Freedom. And you say, whoo, man, I want freedom. And we have the understanding that freedom is found with no laws. And that's wrong. Where you have no laws, you don't have freedom. You have chaos. You have anarchy. You have what we have going on in this world when you take away the laws that are supported by the morality of God uh, and God's moral laws. Uh, when the civil law is trying to be executed without the moral law as its foundation, you don't find more freedom. You find more bondage. So the freedom that Christ came is found within the boundaries of our relationship with Him and His Word. And we begin to lose that experience when we move outside of the boundaries of His Word. Colossians 1 and 3, 1 13 says this, uh, He has, that is, on the cross and becomes ours by experience when we put our faith in Him, He has delivered us. That's past tense. He has delivered us from the power of darkness. And conveyed us, that means translated us, moved us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. And that word power there is the word exousia. It means the authority. And so today we have people that are getting saved and born again and put over here. And and over here, Satan can't do anything about me being here But the fact that I'm here, he wants me to think in my mind that I have to live over here under the pretenses and the power of the things that happened over here. And he doesn't want you to understand that over here, the things over there have no authority over here. The things over there were over there, but the things over here are over here. And I used to be lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. And even though my heart was broken over here, when I come over here, He heals the broken heart. And He gives us a new heart. And the authority of darkness has been broken over our life. Not only does He forgive our sin, but He heals us and He delivers us. And the word in Psalm 147, brokenhearted, means to be shattered like a mirror into a million pieces. And the understanding of the human mind, of the human heart being broken, is that in the human mind, when our heart has been broken this way, we see no conceivable way to put it back together. I sat yesterday on the front row with my... Second cousin's wife, he was 87. I called him my uncle. He's so much older than me. And she's looking at his body laying there in a flag-draped coffin. And she said, Randy, it doesn't seem real. She said, "I, I can't believe that it's happening. She said, I'm not going to make it without him. Her mind was so affected by the profoundness of her loss. That at that moment, in her mind, the reality was this. Your heart has been broken beyond repair. There is no recovery. You cannot make tomorrow. You cannot make the rest of your life. You cannot live in this situation. That is the, that is the initial human response to all trauma. Trauma being anything that happens suddenly or it could happen over time whereby all hope is snatched away from us. It happens in the loss of a child, the loss of a spouse, uh, war, uh, and we experience it as PTSD. It's not just for soldiers who are returning from war. PTSD is post-traumatic 
syndrome disorder. That is where hurt and heartache becomes despair, despondency, depression, and all hope of of, of healing is lost. But part of our redemption at the cross was that Christ came to heal not only our spirit, but also our soul and eventually our body. And in the context of Psalm 147, Israel's, Israel was suffering here in the hope of, uh, in hope during their Babylonian captivity. During their Babylonian captivity, the nation had been punished by her rejection of God, by the mixing of paganism with Judaism. And God had sent them word after word and prophet after prophet, and they refused. So God swept them away into captivity. And over here, they're suffering. But they recall to their mind that the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob was a God who heals. He was a God who heals the brokenhearted. And so even in the midst of their Babylonian captivity, they had an understanding that God could do something for them, even though they were no longer in their land. Now think about this. When this psalm was written and these people were in Babylonian captivity, they had suffered two or three different sieges by Nebuchadnezzar. People had been starved to the point that they ate their own dung. They ate their own children. They lost their nation. They lost their city. They lost their jobs. They lost their families. Uh, every uh, every uh, uh, attack by Babylon, they would take more and more prisoners. That's when Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach were taken off. That was it. They were in the initial uh, 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 abduction and taken away. And so people, homes were split up. Children were murdered. The synagogue was burned down. The temple was burned down. Everything was decimated. They did everything but salt the earth. Those people lost everything. They lost their national identity. They lost their spiritual identity. They lost their families. They lost their health. They lost their home. They were in a foreign land with a foreign God and a foreign language and a foreign uh, writings and everything. And they were at, they lost every. You're talking about traumatic stress. Yet, in the middle of that, as they write their psalms of hope, they recall our verse. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Exactly what is post-traumatic stress disorder? Well, I wrote down the definition. Verbatim, by the way, copy and paste it. PTSD is a mental and behavioral disorder. Meaning that traumas that we go through not only affect us so deeply in our mind and in our spirit, but, they, but the fact that they touch our mind and our spirit so deeply, they affect our behaviors. And we think, that's just the way I am. Not understanding that it's the pain and the suffering that you've been through that's causing you to look at life through a certain lens, which is now changing my behavior. And that's why I don't want to be, I'm not, I don't know anything about anybody here, but that's why some people can't find satisfaction in a marriage. Because it doesn't matter who you marry, Elvis Presley. Okay? You can have enough money to burn a wet mule up in the middle of Lake Tuscaloosa and you can't find happiness. That's because there's something in you that can't be satisfied outside of the healing hand of Jesus. And you're looking for the balm of Gilead in a bar fly. That's a woman. And in a man. And in a bottle. And in a pill. And in a skirt. And in a tattoo. And and, and we're doing everything that we possibly can to find a place where we can fit for a minute that my spirit can find just a moment of peace. And when that begins to flee us, we move. We move to another place, to another town, to another relationship, to another addiction, to another fix, to another job, to another whatever, to another church, to another denomination to another kind of faith if it promises to ease 
this thing that's causing me to be empty. It develops from experiencing traumatic events such as sexual assault, warfare, traffic collisions, child abuse, domestic violence, or threats on a person's life. Its symptoms may include disturbing thoughts, feelings, or dreams related to the event, mental or physical distress to trauma-related cues, meaning things that remind you, triggers thoughts and emotions, attempts to avoid trauma-related cues, attempts to avoid trauma-related cues, meaning that anything that happened that, that led up to this traumatic event, you not only try to avoid trauma in the future, you try to avoid everything that surrounded that. It alters the way a person thinks and feels and increases in the fight-or-flight response. In children and adolescents, there's a strong association between emotional reg regulation difficulties. That means mood swings, outbursts of anger and temper tantrums, and those of post-traumatic stress, independent of age, independent of gender, or independent of the type of trauma, which may, what, basically what it's saying is regardless of your age or your gender. Post-traumatic stress will have a profound effect on your emotions and how you perceive things in the world. Moral injury, moral injury, that is to the heart, is the feeling of moral distress such as shame or guilt. And moral injury is associated with the shame and the guilt while PTSD is more associated with anxiety and fear. You can have both, but they are separate. One brings profound guilt and shame. The other, profound fear and anxiety. And Satan doesn't give up. But let's look at Isaiah chapter 53, verses 3 through 6. Let's just read it up on the screen. He is despised. And this is talking about Jesus and the crucifixion. He is despised and rejected by, by men. Watch this now. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, uh, stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity, and the chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. In other words, what he's saying there, when the event happened, it was understood by the people that this man, Jesus, was being afflicted by God for something that he had done to offend God. Without the understanding that what he was going through was on their behalf. He wasn't being beaten for his faults. He was being beaten for our faults. He wasn't being chastised so that because of something he did. He was being chastised so that you and I could find peace. He was wounded so that we could be healed. He, he was abandoned so that we could be adopted. Everything that he went through was not for himself. It was for us. It was on our behalf. That God laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now listen, we, we pass over this. I need you to grasp this. I say I need. The Holy Spirit needs you to grasp this. He didn't just take your sin. He took your sin and its effect. He took its sorrow. He didn't just take death. He took death's sorrow. And when he says he took upon us sin, he took upon our sin, but he also took our sorrows. He took your suffering. He took your emotional distress. He took your depression. He took your anxiety. He took your post-traumatic stress disorder. He took your, your fear. He took your guilt. He took your shame. I say yours, I'm talking about mine too. He took it for the world. He didn't just take the fact, he didn't just take the sin of divorce. He took the sin of divorce and the feeling of loneliness. He took the sin of divorce and the feeling of, uh, uh, of being uh, abandoned. He didn't just take, the death, uh, take upon him the traumatic death of your child. He took upon it the overwhelming grief that comes with that. So that when the sin was removed, 
the power of that sin, that which continues to affect my mind. You can cut my finger off, and once my finger is off, it's severed. It's never coming back. But that gum, that thing still hurts. He didn't just come to put my finger back on. He came to take away the hurt. He came to bring healing to us from the inside out. When it says that he born, it says that he bore our sorrows. The word born means to carry. And the word sicknesses means mental, uh, physical and mental and emotional diseases and our pains and our sorrows. He came to take that and to remove it. So I wrote down four things. P-A-S-S. You might want to, the little acronym, P-A-S-S. This too shall, this too shall pass. So I want to give you four things that you can do right now. You can't undo what's happened. You can undo how it affects you. You can undo how it affects you. Number one, P, put it all on Jesus. You say, well, Brother Rain, let me tell you what happened to me. Well, why don't you tell me what happened to Jesus? Because what happened to you happened to him. He has certainly carried your griefs and bore your sorrows. Tell me what happened to Jesus. Well, Brother Randy, here's what happened to Jesus. And when you start talking about it in third person, when you start talking about like it, or is that second person? Somebody help me, English maybe. First, first person, them, third, okay, third person. Let me tell you what happened to Jesus. When Jesus was young, he was abused. And when Jesus grew up, he couldn't forget what happened. And because he couldn't remember, forget what happened, it began to affect his life. And it changed everything about him. That's what happened to Jesus. And I said, well, go on. What happened? Well, eventually, he went to the cross. And what happened at the cross? He took all that that happened to him, and he nailed it. And he took all that that happened to him, and he broke its power. And he took all that happened to him, and he laid it before God, and God redeemed it. So when we think about the things that have happened to us, we need to think about them in the terms that, of Jesus. Look at 1 Peter 5, 7. We're going to put it up here. Casting all your care on him, for he cares for you. Now, let's just back that up. First of all, you need to know that Jesus cares about what happened to you. I've heard today in Sunday school, I hear it all the time. I've even wondered about it myself. Uh, matter of fact, Larry Solomon talked to us about somebody in his family that served in World War II and was at Iwo Jima and was there when they raised the flag. And he said, I've been in war. And from what I observe, there can be no God. Because if there was a God and he cared, he would not have let the atrocities of war that I saw happen to happen and that goes on down through the line if God was God and if God cared he wouldn't have let this happen and, and we say that uh, since it did happen then there can't be a God and if there is a God he certainly doesn't care let's just back up he cares there is a God and he cares there is a God and he cares and he says let me tell you something that stuff that you're carrying won't you throw it over on me uh, all that, that I don't know what your baggage is. I, I don't know whether you did it or they did it or they did it to you or you did it to them and then they did it back. I don't know how that goes and it's not important. But whatever it is that you're carrying, you need to put it on Jesus. Uh, either you're going to carry it or he's going to carry it, but y'all both ain't going to carry it. And we need to put it on him because we understand that he exists and that he cares. And he said, put it on me. I did a teaching some time back a year or so ago, uh, about, and we used a teaching, uh, an example of a situation that happened with a Navy SEAL. And when he came to himself and he'd been blown to bits and disfigured and all that, he heard people talking. He heard people talking in the background saying, it's so sad that we send these young boys away. And they come back so broken and so, so, uh, so torn apart, both mentally and physically and spiritually. It's just... Horrendous. And he said, I heard that. And he said, I, I told my wife to bring me a pen. And he, and he wrote kind of this magna carta of, of his life. 
And he said, don't you enter into this room feeling sorry for me. Your sorrow is not welcomed here. I will take everything that God has left me, and I will use it to get better. I am not the victim. I am the victor. Now, guys, that's strong. Jameis Winston would say that's strong. What that means is, is that when you put it all over on God, that immediately from that point forward, you are no longer the victim of what happened. If Jesus is carrying it, and if there's anybody that's a victim, it's him. It's not you. Everything that happened to you has now been put on him. We, that's not just uh, the power of positive thinking. That is spiritual truth. We've already been through that at the cross. He bore it. So it happened to him, so why not put it on? You've got to shift the weight. You've got to shift the weight. And when we were walking the Appalachian Trail, I just thought about this, and me and Jimmy Maddox, Jimmy Maddox is a warrior, man. We took off on the Appalachian Trail, and he didn't tell me because he didn't want to, he didn't want to back out, but he had herniated a disc in his back. He had a herniated disc in his back, and he loaded up with, pain medications and anti-inflammatories and he and I set out with backpacks to walk 80 miles on the Appalachian Trail in five days and he goes flex man he said my legs kill me I said what's wrong with you man he said I got a herniated disc I what the Sam Hill are you out here for well I didn't want to quit and I didn't want to leave you well I didn't want to cancel the trip because of me I said so we're out here with you a herniated disc your, your leg is dead and you got a backpack so you know what we did we put the stuff that he Absolutely needed his water and stuff when we put it in a waistband around his waist and I took his pack. Because he wasn't going to finish carrying his pack. You ain't going to finish. By that I mean you're not going to live life to its fullest if you keep trying to tote all that stuff that happened to you. You're going to have to you're going to have to break down and eat your pride and say, God, I can't do it. I cannot do it. I have got to hand you my backpack. I've got to give you everything that I think i got to have for myself, and i got to give it to you. I can't carry it no more. It'll break you down. And you've got to quit being the victim. You've got to shift the weight, and that includes forgiveness. You go, oh, I knew you were going to get to it. I knew you were going to get to forgiveness. I knew, and that right there is where I got problems, Brother Randy. Well, let, 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 me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me throw it out there to you. Forgiveness doesn't mean you let them off the hook. Forgiveness means that you forsake or release your right to get even. In other words, I ain't going to try to make them pay for what they did. Because to make them pay for what they did, i got to carry that pack. Because payback is in the pack. That's part of the weight. And if I'm going to put the weight on Jesus, payback goes with it. And God says, cast your cares on me, I care for you. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, and I will repay. And if there's a, there's a getting even day, there's a getting even day. And God said, that ain't your business. Getting even is my business. Walking in freedom is your business. And if you'll let me take care of my business and you take care of your business, then business will be handled. Forgiveness don't mean you forget it. People say, well, God said he forgets my sin. Let me just put something to mind. If God can forget anything, then he ain't God. Because he has perfect knowledge, and perfect knowledge is eternal from everlasting to everlasting. When it says that he forgets it, it means that he forgets it in regard to its application to you, and he'll never bring it up again. Forgiveness means you just don't bring it up no more. Ain't nothing to talk about. You did what you did. It happened. I forgive you. That means that I ain't going to kill you. That's what it means. But we ain't going to swap slobber. We ain't going to swap Christmas presents. I ain't coming to your party. You ain't coming to mine. See, people think that forgiveness means that uh, you can slap my teeth out and then I'll invite you to supper. That ain't what it means. It means that I ain't going to slap your teeth out. That's all it means. But don't push it. 
Because on any given day, I'm like, I'm like Jim Pennington. I'm like Shrek. I'm like, I'm donkey on the edge now. Don't mess with me. <laughs> we got to forgive. Payback belongs to God. Number two, A, you and I must actively resist the enemy. You can't bury your head in the sand and think that it's going to go away. You can't drink it out. You can't snort it out. You can't shoot it out. You can't tat it out. You can't sex it out. You can't party it out. You can't girl it out or boy it out or whatever it is. It won't work. The only thing that's going to heal you is the truth of God's Word. The truth of God's Word. Ephesians 6, 10 through 13, and then verse 18. You see, guys, let's just use this for an example. You were sexually abused. That event happened and that person did it. But from that point forward, your enemy is trying to keep you in the moment. In the pain. In the sorrow. In the defeat. In the shame. So when it says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles. That word wiles means the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against the spiritual host of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. You see, we have the victory in Christ, but that word stand is an active word. means stand your ground. Don't back up. Don't let the enemy, because this happened, don't let the enemy cause you to back up. Don't back up in shame. Don't back up in guilt. Don't surrender your relationships. Don't surrender your sanity. Don't surrender your mind. Don't surrender your joy. Don't surrender your peace. It, because it happened, it happened, and God's going to deal with that. And I'll always forg- I'm going to forgive you. It just simply means you, you need to step aside. God's got you. I'm going to walk in the joy and the hope and the freedom and the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where the enemy comes in in a spiritual way to continue the attack. You were physically abused once, but the enemy wants you to live with the mentality of abuse. You've been divorced and abandoned once. The enemy wants you to live under the spirit and the clause of abandonment. Because you were deemed unworthy, you thought yourself unclean because you were molested at five years old, and here you are at 25, and you thought that if you had sex with this boy, he would love you. But now you're thinking that that's the only reason he loved you, and you're 35, and you're not, you don't have this emotional sp- uh, connection with your spouse. It's because you thought you'd, you compromised yourself again to earn the love of somebody, and now you don't really believe that he loves you. You think it's, he just loves you because of what you're doing for him, and all you're doing is playing mental gymnastics with an enemy that's trying to keep you in the moment trying to keep you in the prison. But he said he came to set the captives free, to open the doors of the prison. He came to take the shackles off. The, I, we cannot change the event, but it does not have to shackle you. And you do not have to live behind closed doors. You can walk out. You can walk in freedom. You can walk in hope. You can walk in, in um, grace. The enemy wants you to relive it over and over and over again. But the Scripture says that we must take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. The Scripture tells us that we can select our thoughts. He says, whatsoever things are true and noble and just and pure and lovely and praiseworthy, think on these things. When you find your mind starting to go back to the place, go back to the time, go back to the feeling, when you begin to sense that, you've got to stop it. It's like Stopping the car, you just got to put it in park and open the door and step out. And you go, that's not of God. That's the enemy trying to drag me back into my past. Get behind me, Satan, for he was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquity. The chastisement of my peace was was upon him, and with his stripes I am healed. I choose today to think about the goodness of God. I choose to think about the power of God, about the blood of Jesus Christ. I am no longer that person. I have been made new. Where the, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. 
Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I'm not going to try to live for Jesus over here. I'm not going to let you drag me back. I put my foot down. I put my armor on. I'm going to stand strong in the power of the Lord and in the strength of his armor, and I'm going to fight. I'm going to fight, and the fight is in prayer. I'm going to pray till you get away from my door. Get away from my mind. You want to keep hearing me pray? Then just keep on pestering me. You want to you get tired of hearing the name Jesus? Then just keep on messing with me. You keep trying to, you get tired of hearing me talking about the blood of Jesus? Then you just keep hanging around me. But when you've had enough, you need to tell me when you had enough. Then you get behind me because that's not how I'm going to live my life. For greater is he that is in me than you that is in the world. And you got to fight. For your right to live free. It ain't going to just happen. You can't cry it out. S. You got to stand on God's truth. First John 8, 32 through 36. Jesus said, you shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. And they answered him. That's the Pharisees. The religious elite. We are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus said to him, I liked it. Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. You see, there's people today in prison that are locked behind bars and sliding metal doors that are more free than people that are sitting today in the congregations of America. Because freedom is not about where my body is, it's about where my mind is. I'm going to say that again. Freedom is not about where my body is, it's about where my mind is. And there are people that are free with regards to no bondage of law enforcement, shackles, or steel doors. Yet they are victims in in their own prison. And there are people that are born again in prison doing life without parole that are free. So therefore, you don't have to change jobs. You don't have to change boyfriends or husbands. You don't have to change churches. It's it's a matter of what do you believe to be true. And truth is defined by God's word. It's defined by God's word. You say, I'm trapped in this marriage. Well, if you think you are, you are. I'm going to say that again. I'm trapped. And then you just fill in the blank. And if you think you are, you are. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. What do you believe to be true about the word of God? If Jesus said, I came that you might have peace, and you think you're trapped without peace, which one of those statements is true? The one you believe. It's the one you believe. If Christ died on the cross for all the world, yet all the world is not saved, is it because he didn't die for the world? Or because half the world doesn't believe it? Half the world doesn't believe it. Therefore, they're trapped. But for the half that believes, they're free. He said, said, you shall know the truth. Then he goes down and he tells them in John 17, 15 through 17, I do not pray that you should take them out of, I love this scripture. I do not pray, Jesus is praying for his disciples. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world. Now, let's just stop right there. The world is filled with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It's ruled by the prince of darkness. I would have said, Lord, Just as quick as they get saved, take them. 
depopulate the earth with people that are believing, right? I believe, boom, I'm gone. I believe, boom, I'm gone. I don't have to do warfare with the devil. I don't have to fight for my faith. I don't have to, you know, all these things. That's, Jesus didn't pray that. Here's what he said. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. Well, how's he going to do that? Well, he begins by saying, they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them. That means separate them from the enemy by your truth. Your word is truth. See, if you stand in truth, the enemy can't touch you. Because he's a liar and the father of it. He ain't going to get close to the truth. The truth, if you know it, will set you free. And if the Son has set you free, you're free indeed. You say, well, if I'm free indeed, then why do I feel this way? Because you feel that way. And you're living by your feelings. It says the truth will set you free. Well, I don't feel free. Again. It's, it's what you believe to be true. How many of y'all have ever been hungry? Just pray. And here's what you said. I'm starving to death. Is that a true statement? No. Why do you say that? Because you feel real hungry. And you think if you don't get something to eat, you may die. Now, that's a stupid saying. But we use it to communicate, to, to put emphasis on the fact that I'm hungry. Well, the enemy of your soul wants you to say things and think things to emphasize what you're not experiencing. I feel lonely. Oh, yes, you are lonely. You're sorry. Nobody likes you. I'm just going to tell you right off the bat. <laughs> Psalm 107, 20. You hold in your lap the keys to the kingdom. You hold in your lap the keys to the kingdom. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Behold, I give you the keys to the kingdom. Never walk in freedom without the keys. But with the keys, you'll never live locked up. You'll never live in bondage. You'll never live in fear with the keys. Lastly, the second S, seek wise counsel. What is wise counsel? I started to give you a bunch of verses, but I decided to keep it simple. And wise counsel is biblical counsel. People that are talking to you from the Bible. People who have an understanding of Scripture. Not other people. That's been, you say, well, they've been through the same thing. Are they born again and are they talking out of the Scriptures? It doesn't matter that they've been through the same thing. There's a way to deal with things according to the world and there's a way to deal with things according to the Word. Wise counsel is people that deal with it according to the Word. Wise counsel. Let's put it up there, Shannon, if you don't mind, Proverbs. Where there is no counsel, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is, is safety. You say, wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. Do you mean I need to tell somebody about what happened? No, you don't have to tell it. But here's what I will tell you. That the power of sin is in secrecy. It's in darkness. I talked to a man on the morning word this past week when we talked about this right here in a very condensed fashion. And I said, you need to find a, a godly, trusted friend, and you need to tell them what happened to you because the power of sin is in secrecy and in darkness. That's why pedophiles threaten children with not telling, if you tell, I'll kill your mom. If you tell, I'll kill your daddy. And they think that by threatening them with some kind of harm to someone else, it will keep them under their power. And secrecy keeps you under sin's power. Now, I'm not talking about go on Facebook. I must confess. (laughs) 
I'm talking about somebody that if, you're, that if you had to go to war would be your first phone call. You say, well, I don't have anybody like that. That'd be something I'd work on. That'd be something I'd work on. While our religion, our salvation is personal, it was never meant to be private. Now, it wasn't meant to be publicized, but it was meant to be shared. Wise counsel, that is, people that can talk to you from the Bible. As iron sharpens iron, Proverbs 27, 17, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. So let me go back to my story. I was talking to the guy on the morning word, and he said, this happened to me when I was a young boy. And he said, it wasn't until I was 64 years old that I told this to a friend. And he said, and for the first time in my life, it was like the world was taken off my shoulder. Finally, finally, the secrecy and the shroud of secrecy had been broken, and with it, the weight. He said, it was so healing, it was so freeing, it was so powerful just to tell one person. Just one other person knowing. That's all it took. It was just like night and day. It was over. And now he was telling me on Facebook Messenger. I mean, he said, here's, and now here's something. Let me just say this, and we're going to be closing. Sean, if you come. Actually, we're going to play, play that song again, that video again, if you don't mind. Just play it a little bit softer. It'll be the hardest thing you've ever done leading up to it. It'll be the greatest thing you've ever done after you've done it. I don't need you to tell me. I don't need you to tell Pastor Jeff. I don't even need you to tell your spouse. But you need to tell somebody. Maybe catch a train, go up to New Jersey and find some Catholic priest <laughs> and walk in there and say, Dude, if you tell anybody, so help me God, I'll have you defrocked. But I'm finna lay something on you real heavy, and then I'm going back to Alabama. You hear me? <laughs> How's God going to heal you with his word? And, and what's he going to restore to you? Hope. Identity. By that, I mean security. Peace. Joy. And love. Now, before we start this song, not to single anybody out about what or the nature of, of your brokenheartedness, if you feel like right now, under the presence and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, not Pastor Randy, that you need to stand up and begin your active resistance against the enemy trying to keep you in bondage. And you want to go on record as saying, I am the victim of a broken heart, and I want to come out of the shadows. I hear the sound of freedom. What is the sound of freedom? The movie. What is the sound of freedom? Here it is right here. You ready? For the Christian, the sound of freedom is three words. It is finished.